Hi, this is AF Charters for A Critical State. Today you join us in the city-state of the City of London. You heard correctly, this is a city-state. It's not part of the UK in the proper jurisdiction, okay? So we're going to be talking today to Dom and Vin from Standing in Commerce. So let's go to the Fire of London, which is what the monument here commemorates. This is a major historical event that happened in 1666. And there's a lot of hidden history that you need to know about this. So here I am walking into Pudding Lane. This is a really historic place and I'm joined by a couple of gentlemen who are going to fill us in on some of the history. So I have Dr. Dominic here How from Standing in Commerce, nice to meet you. And I have Vincent, who's uh, also going to be filling us in on the judicial system and law. So first of all, we're going to move over to Dominic because he's uh, studied in great detail what has been happening here in London in 1666. And I don't mean just what was happening here in Pudding Lane, but events that were happening off camera, shall we say, in Westminster. We like the idea of making it better, but we just can't be bothered. So what more can we do? Yes, we lack the idea of making it better, but we just can't be bothered. So Dominic, Pudding Lane, the Great Fire of London, 1666. We learn about this in our school history. Some of us that live close enough, like myself, would be lucky enough to do a, a trip to come and see Pudding Lane, where the bakery was set light. We'd hear about the Great Plague and how it was a terrible event. Absolutely. But just like uh, when Rome burned, when London burned, there were great uh, changes happening over in Parliament, not so far from here. What kind of changes were those? Well, um, the subrogation of men and women's rights. In what way were they subrogated? Well, there was an act passed, it's like uh, when Rome burned, when London burned, there were great uh, changes happening over in Parliament, not so far from here. What kind of changes were those? Well, um, the subrogation of men and women's rights. In what way were they subrogated? Well, there was an act passed whilst uh, uh, London was burning. Right. Um, so literally while the fire is burning down here? Well, it takes a long time to bring a statute to the books. Right. It takes a lot of architecture and a lot of thinking by the judiciary and then to debate it through Parliament. Sure. And obviously the Black Death was carried on for quite some time here. Certainly. Um, but I, the question I would ask is, what was the Sesti KV Act of 1666 being put on the statute books whilst, you know, the proverbial hell was happening on the streets of London? Now, for those of you who are not quite sure what this act is that Dominic has just talked about, we will actually be putting links on the website and probably bringing up uh, information about this at the end of the show. So don't worry if you can't follow the intricate detail it's much more important to understand the bigger picture. So, Dominic, this Sestike Act, what did it actually say? Well, after uh, several hundred readings, we finally came to the conclusion that it would appear that all of the citizens, all the men, of, all the men and women of the United Kingdom were declared dead and lost, its, lost beyond the seas. What does that mean, then? Well, the state took everybody in everybody and everybody's property into trust and they, the state became the trustee husband behind all the title and owns all the titles to both the people and their property so the state took control by saying everyone is dead and until a living man or woman comes back and claims their titles and when they do prove that they are alive then the titles can be revested and they can claim the damages. Okay, so essentially where we are right now is that still today, here in, 19, in, in 2009, that legally speaking, you and I, on camera, we are dead. Absolutely, because you didn't claim your titles back after seven years, as it says in the statutes. Wait a minute, so, seven so, years after 1666? Seven years after you were born. Oh really? So 
I have time from when I'm born to when I'm seven to claim. Yes. Otherwise, you are dead beyond reasonable doubt. Okay. And therefore, the state takes your property and your body into trust. That's fascinating. And this all came about as a result of the Great Fire. Well, it could be a bit of a smokescreen. Right. <laughs> That's a nice metaphor. So, the Sestike Act fundamentally underlines that you or I are dead. Now, does that have anything to do with when we go to court and we're not allowed to represent ourselves? Absolutely. We're starting to see the beginning of the creation of a legal fiction of a dead entity. What is a legal fiction? It's a construct on paper. So when you get a bill or a summons from a court, it's always in capital letters. Right. Now, last time I went into a graveyard, all of the, uh, on all the graves, all the, le all the names, all the men and women, were in capital letters. Right. That's mort main, probate, death. Right. So the, the state or the corporation that writes to you in all capital letters is writing to a dead legal fiction. So do I have a legal fiction? A legal fiction was created um, when your mother informed the state or the registrar general that there was a new vessel in town when, when you were birth. So you have a birth certificate just like a ship. Now a birth certificate is spelt B-I-R-T-H, but we're talking about a birth, as in B-E-R-T-H, which is where you would moor a boat, is that correct? Correct. Now, your mother has a, had a birth canal, right. just, like, just like a ship. Okay, so... I think you could say that beyond reasonable doubt, that the legal fiction is classified as a vessel. And as we now understand, is floating on the sea of commerce. So I'm an actor in commerce? Yes, you're, you have a legal fiction which allows you to operate in commerce. And it was created when your mother and father registered you and got a birth certificate from the Registrar General. But they didn't know anything about this, right? They didn't know anything about it. They just thought that they were doing the same thing as happened before in the, in the 18th century and before where people would go to the, to the church and ask the priest or the vicar to give them a slip of paper and put them into the local registry in the church and give them a copy for their own Holy Bible at home. So when did this change over? Um, in about 1837 when the uh, Births, Deaths and Marriages Act and the, reg the, the post of Registrar General came into being and his job was to collect all of the records from all the churches. Now, the word regus I find very interesting because mm -hmm. register comes from regus. That means the queen Absolutely. or the crown. Or the so crown. that would actually mean that mm -hmm. children are property of the crown. Is that correct? The legal fictions are indeed. So does that have any ramifications for our viewers? Well, the registrar general holds everybody in custody. So essentially everyone that is a UK citizen registered with a passport, national insurance number, etc., is essentially in custody. That's right. But being in custody typically is something that you think of as the police doing when you've done something wrong. But that doesn't necessarily mean that custody in the way that you're using it is a bad thing. No, the, the creation of the uh, legal entity, sometimes known as the straw man or a straw party, um, allows uh, men and women, one, to function in commerce, and to, to, and to to accept the benefit privileges provided by the state. What kind of things such are as that? Such as national health insurance, national insurance, uh, the doll, um, clothes, food, heat. Right. No, we don't enjoy nothing about being So what we're actually talking about is that we are in custody, we don't know that we have a legal fiction, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. No, because the majority of the people in this country and everybody that operates this system worldwide under the International Monetary Fund, we hope that the vast majority of people are fed, sheltered and watered. But 
unfortunate as we start seeing these systems break down and not operate to the, to the benefits of the people. This is where things start going wrong. Fine, so it's, it's entirely possible that these systems have changed over the years and become more draconian and unfair against men and women. Um, like myself and Vincent will say, itself is neutral and can be operated for the benefit of men and women. It all depends on the, level, sorry, the level of education of the men and women in, in society and who is pulling the levers. Absolutely. That's an important point. We still have legally um, elected representatives. The system that we're operating in is just not the same system that we understand it to be. It's a parallel system. And we have to understand exactly who we are as individuals and how we can operate in this system. And that's what we're going to be looking out, uh, out for throughout the show with Vincent and also with Dominic. And there we cannot face the Lord So I hope that you find What it is you're looking for Yes, I hope The City of London is renowned worldwide for being a centre for markets. Now markets is where merchants work, so there's mercantile law. Now mercantile law is based on admiralty, so if we look around us, particularly here in the city, we can find a great deal of symbols that relate to admiralty. We're still here in the city state of London, but we've just taken a short walk from Pudding Lane down King William Street, in fact, to the Bank of England. Now, Dominic, the Bank of England is quite an important piece to understand in all of this because surely this is the People's Bank, isn't it? Well, we believe it was the People's Bank in 1946 when it was taken from private hands, allegedly, into the public. But unfortunately, as it says in the statutes, the, uh, the shareholders from private Bank of England did a one-to-one -one stock swap with the new bank. So the private shareholders are still the public, are the hot shareholders of the public bank. So on the news, we're forever hearing about the Bank of England and how it's going to be issuing currency and doing things for the people of the United Kingdom. So is this actually our bank? Well, the building might be the People's Bank of England, but uh, in 1946, when it was uh, taken into, into the public, there was a one-to-one -one stock swap with the private shareholders from the private Bank of England. Therefore, even though the bank building itself might be in public hands, the shareholders, of whom I've yet to find a list, are private. So you're saying that where we are at the moment is that the Bank of England serves interests other than those of the people of the United Kingdom, i.e. a list of potential investors whose names remain private? It could well be, Adrian. And uh, if you look at the definition of the word of in a legal dictionary, it can also mean without. So that means the bank without England? Correct. What does that actually mean? Well, um, we, it would appear that the Bank of England behaves in the same manner that the Federal Reserve does, which is known to be a private bank that issues private currency. So if an organisation is issuing private currency, the interest that it puts on it, where does that actually go? 
Well, that's a question for another day, Adrian, because uh, I think you might create too much controversy. But, uh, you know, we can talk about that at a later time. Absolutely. So the currency that's issued by the Bank of England, which at the moment is the sole organisation able to issue currency in this country, is that backed by anything like gold? I mean, this is a pretty substantial building. Um, it used to be backed by gold um, until about 1914, where you could go in and take a £5 note or a £10 note into the Bank of England and have it redeemed by gold or silver coin. Now, 1914 is quite an important historical date because it's the start of the First World War. I don't enjoy you And you know you don't enjoy me We know we don't enjoy nothing About being me and you Right, so and up until that date, I would have been able to take in a £5 note and get £5 worth of gold or silver coins. Yes, or a certificate for it. And nowadays, if I go in there and take a £5 note in there, what will they give me back? A £5 note. And what's that backed on? What's that backed with? Well, if it's not backed by gold or silver, then the only thing that it can be backed by is the population's labour, past, present and future which is represented by your birth certificate. We as a population have been pledged to the IMF as the surety to pay back the creditors in the global bankruptcy. That's an interesting point that you know. That you, know. you say global bankruptcy, so are you suggesting that we are bankrupt? Men and women are not bankrupt. Men right. and women are the only source of credit, but the public is bankrupt and all the corporations are bankrupt. What event brought about this bankruptcy? Well, bankruptcy for, for this country has been going on since we started going to war and colonizing everywhere. But bankruptcy can be brought on by world wars, by catastrophes, or by writing large numbers of bonds as sureties for banks. Is that something that's been happening recently? About 63 trillion of them. 63 per trillion pounds or dollars? Dollars. So the currency that gets issued at the Bank of England, if it's not backed by gold or silver, does that mean that we, standing here, are actually the treasure? Absolutely. We are the gold. So how does that play out in terms of our debts and all of the things that are happening around us? Well, for instance, um, I think we're having uh, the Olympic Games here in 2012 in London. That's absolutely right. And uh, the last time I looked, uh, the government didn't have any money. So what does it do? It issues some bonds or some treasury, treasury bills or some treasury notes or some treasury bonds, which are bought by investors. And that money goes back into the economy in order to pay for the people to build the National Stadium, for instance, the Olympic Stadium. So we're paying for the Olympic Games? Of course we are. And some people say that wouldn't be a bad thing. But unfortunately, you're paying taxes for the privilege of using somebody else's currency and paying back the principal and the interest on the original loan that was given against the Treasury bonds, the Treasury bills and the Treasury notes. So when the... When so ultimately, when the Olympic Stadium has been built, the men and women of Britain have used their own resources to build a stadium that doesn't belong to them and paid the privilege, the principal and the interest on the original loan, plus the taxes for the privilege of using somebody else's fiat monetary system. There's a lot of information there that you've just mentioned. Let me just break that down a little bit. So what you're actually saying is that a private corporation will actually own the Olympic Stadium. A private corporation will be responsible for the running of the Olympic Games and will no. be able to sell commercial rights, yet we the people are actually the ones that own it and that should be profiting from that. But even if we did own it, 
you've still paid the principal and the interest back to the people that originally bought the treasury bonds and the treasury bills that were sold by the Bank of England in order to raise the money. That's quite an interesting perspective on things. Why is it that this information is not more readily available in the public? Because we don't get time. And our education system doesn't, uh, doesn't furnish people with, the, with, this, with this information readily. Where can, where can viewers that are watching this get more information about these kind of subjects? Well, we'll, we'll give you a list um, and a few PowerPoint slides that you can put up on... Uh, Fantastic, the, that would yeah, be great. All the, all the references that we've covered today uh, will be available through your TV programme. Are you planning on doing any talks or presentations about this in the future? Well, we've been running uh, presentations, uh, not just about the historical perspective and how this system was put in place, but giving people practical solutions about how they can operate as a creditor in the bankruptcy. Yeah, I think that's something that we'll be looking at a little bit later in the show. Thanks very much for that. Thanks, Adrian. What you're going to see tonight is 819 years of history. I'm not all there, I promise you. <laughs> but very key aspects of this history that's led us to where we are now. So, what we're going to do tonight, we're going to take a conspiracy, well, I hope you all know what conspiracy theory is, I presume you all do, and we're going to turn it into fact. Real fact, you can go and check out. I don't want you to believe a word I'm saying tonight. Absolutely, I want you to go and check this stuff out for yourself. When you check it out, you will suddenly find that there is a lot of truth out there. You just got to know where to look. Right, this is the document. This is unbelievable. Right, this is you've, you've all seen this, yeah? You know what this is, yeah? Birth certificate. Right. You get a certified copy. You do not get the original, because that goes somewhere else. This up here, when you actually look at this, you, get, you look at this and you get your own. When you get home, or get, or you get your kids, whatever, get this document and look at it, because it's phenomenal what they've done. The name of the person's being created in capitalised surname. See the surnames in capitals, okay? It's a fiction. This is being created. That fiction is going to be created there. But what they need is, they need another fiction to do it. They have to have a fiction there to do this, who is the informant. You actually inform on your own children. Do you know that? You inform on them. It's brilliant, isn't it? Eh? And your qualification is, you're one of their parents. Mad, mad. And it's capitalised, it's all capitalised. And it is absolutely true, look at your birth certificate, informant, the qualification needed, and it will say needed, and you inform because you are the father or the mother. What you don't know is that at the bottom there is a declaration. Now, a declaration is in common law. A declaration is a sworn oath of a man. And there's a reason that's on the bottom. Because without that man or woman being present, the fictionous mother or father isn't present. Now you're seeing that the person is attached to the human being. But to do this, they need the human being to be there. That's why there's a declaration at the bottom of it. And this, it says it quite simply. It, you, you have to be present to represent the person needed to create the new person's legal personality. I know it's a tongue, it, 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 believe me, I, it's mind-boggling. But it's, it really is. This is what we found. And it all makes sense. That's the point. This is what I want to tell you about it. And then you register it to a corporation. <laughs> the General Register Office. Get your birth certificate and lift it up and you'll see G-R-O. It's a General Register Office. 
That's who you're registering it to. Registration on your children, and this is not funny, this is really, really true, okay? To this day, registration still means the same thing. You hand over or you transfer the legal title to the body you have registered it with. As you have seen, the worst possible way this has been done is by the birth certificate. It's been abused. A simple show of this is to, do you have to mandatory school your children? Well, you do. And can you take them on holiday when you want to? No. Because what happens when you take them out of term time? I know people have received £100 fines for taking their kids out of term time, taking them on holiday. And they have to be vaccinated. The thing is, it's their property. You signed over title ownership of that child to the government when you registered it. You don't, you've got no claim to your children whatsoever. You just don't know it because you've been duped. If you want proof of it, the social services. What happens when you don't look after their property or they pertain you're not looking after their property properly? What happens? They take the child away. Because politics is not what you think it is. The members of parliament, anybody seen this before? This is Dunham Bradstreet. Do you know what Dunham Bradstreet is? Right. <laughs> if you were going to do business with a corporation or a company in the world, then you can use Dun & Bradstreet, which at the moment is about 160 million corporations worldwide. You can use these to find out if that corporation does good business. Does it have any debts? Has it got any uh, county court judgments against it? So what this is, is a register of corporations, of companies, and the members of parliament are a company. Gordon Brown is a company. David Cameron is a company. And this one I like. The Labour Party trade as Alistair Darling MP. <laughs> it's their trading name. It's just there. The reason they trade with Alistair Darling MP is because Alistair Darling is a diplomat. There's about three of them. If they trade in his name, that trading name has diplomatic status. That means they can bend things and do things that you don't know about. It's a whole different way of doing things. This is what politics is about. This is what you believe to be the people representing you. The United Kingdom is a corporation. Now, up till February of last year, it was United Kingdom PLC. In February, and it's dissolved, and they've never, ever published their accounts. If you want to check that out, go on Companies House, because it's there. But on Dun & Bradstreet, they're now registered as United Kingdom Corporation Limited. Any corporation has employees. The employees are not just civil servants, they're all of you. Every one of you. If you have a national insurance number, that means you too are an employee. Com company policy of this corporation requires you as an employee to pay tax, follow all the legislative rules of that corporation, in this case, statutes. As in any company, if you break the rules, you will be disciplined under company, that company's legislation. The police of the United Kingdom Corporation are all companies too run for profit. Because that's what companies basically do. They run for profit. And who are they making profit for? <laughs> Directors, shareholders, they all want a profit. And where does that profit come from? <laughs> the corporate poli policy enforcement officers, their job is to enforce the rules of the corporation. The courts of the United Kingdom Corporation are all companies run for profit as well. If you break the rules, you will, be, you will get an invite, which is a summons. You will there to their place of business to discuss your punishment. 
except that they are not inviting you. You just think they are. Even the highest court in the land is a corporation, the House of Lords. So, we believe that the courts are issuing us justice. We believe that we're going to get a lawful trial. There is a massive difference between lawful and legal. Massive difference. You like this picture? This is very, very important. I want to explain something. During my life growing up, I am a, I am, I am a fully fledged carpenter as well. Um, and that's all I do. I'm just a working class man. All through my life, I was, I was a bit of a bugger when I was young, to, to say the least. And there was a, a policeman called Mick Reed, who was a very dear friend of mine, who helped me incredibly when I was young. Because when I was growing up, I didn't fit into anything. I didn't fit into any group or I didn't fit a slot. I always questioned everything. And I questioned discipline. I questioned authority. If I thought it was wrong. And I suffered for it as well, many, many times. But Mick showed me that there is what a real policeman's about. And this is where this comes from. This is where I understand this now. A policeman, a human being, his duty under common law of this land is to serve and protect every individual in this land. You've heard Albert say this today. That is his duty. That is what he does his job for, to serve and protect and never, ever delay right or justice to any individual in this land. That's their job. They must uphold the common law. But they have a fiction attached to them called a police officer. Now, if you look at the word officer, it comes from the corporate world. What's a CEO? Chief Executive Officer. It's all officers. They're all, they're unbelievable. This man on my right is who enforces statutes on you. This man protects you. But the trouble is, the boys in blue, who I have all the admiration in the world for, because I've got a lot of friends in the police force, don't know the difference. They don't know the difference anymore. And some of them didn't know the difference in the first place because they're being told wrong. They're not being told about this bit, they're only being told about this bit. And funny enough, I had a conversation with Albert the other day and he was telling me some things that are going on in the police force regarding their training at the moment. And all of them are being trained to be this. Okay? So when, when you meet these people, what we're trying to do is, I wouldn't say educate them, we're trying to, make, try to bring them to an understanding of what they really are and what they're supposed to do. And I recently, same as Albert did, I went for a police force from down the bottom to a chief inspector, a major chief inspector, overall statutory legislation, and you go back to common law. Anybody can do it. You've just got to know the language to speak because there's a language they're using against you that you do not understand. You might think you do because it's English. But it's their language, it's called legal lease. It's the language of the law society. Any society, I'll go into this in a bit, but any society, you can start a society tomorrow and create your own language. Anybody can do it. So we need to just gently tell these people. Now, we have methods of talking to these people that sometimes prevents us being dragged down ourselves. And I will be going into that. But it doesn't always work. Because if they're going to slap the cuffs off you and drag you away, they're going to do it. Okay? And you might as well just make it easy, but always let them know that you are protesting. Peacefully. No violence. No violence whatsoever. This is not about violence. It's a bit like Gandhi said, an eye for an eye just ends up with the world being all blind. Know who you are. If you go to court, which I've... Uh, had a few um, accountants with, to say the least. <laughs> it's a corporate place of business. And they will immediately ask you for your name. Okay? Your name. They will even presume to know who you are. And they will ask you as such. They would say to me, Mr. Harris, 
Mr. is the title of something with legal personality status. I was known by my parents, well, I wasn't called Mr. John Harris. Well, I think so. If I reply yes, guess what I've agreed to represent? A man cannot be acted upon by statutes, nor can a woman, a human being, a living soul. These only apply to the fictional entity, which is the legal personality, i.e. Mr. John Harris in full caps, or Mr. J. Harris. Every title in this land is a fiction. If you're Lord whatever, it's a fiction. Every title is a fiction. Because it doesn't apply to a human being. It's the legal status. Remember the word status. It comes into everything. I like the, do you like the pictures? Photocopied as well. Right. It's the easiest way of doing it because it, I wanted a cardboard cutout so I can say, look, this is the fiction and this is the living soul because it's hard for you to grasp that there is, you're, you're two, you're two people. You just don't know you are. That's really, really hard to, sorry, really, really hard to um, grasp. Natural law and common law applies to me. Okay? Inherent law. You don't need him to be told it. You know what's right or wrong. Do you not? You know, don't you? It's inherent. It's just there. Commercial policy, civil policy and political policy applies to the fiction. But they need that to represent it. Because that doesn't exist. The only basic principles that any people of any nation need to adhere to are those of natural law, which are mirrored in common law, never harm or cause loss. It covers every eventuality. There is nothing it doesn't cover. Nothing. Common law applies to a man or a woman, a living soul. Statute rules apply to the person. Only when the man or woman consents to represent the person. Fixed penalty notices. So why are there so many fixed penalty notices? You get a fine for filling your bin up too much, or putting it out on the wrong day, or sticking it in the wrong position. Speed cameras, sawn documents. Well, what are these notices in the real world? They've been issued by corporations. And the corporations are dreaming up more and more reasons for penalising you. Penalised by the way of forfeit. Something surrendered subject to surrender as punishment for a breach of contract. These are called adhesion contracts. An adhesion contract is a type of contract that is legal and binding agreement that someone writes, makes it there, they basically do as they please. They've got all the bargaining power, they attach it to you, and it's to their advantage. A notice is not a bill. A notice is not a demand. If you went to a restaurant and the waiter come up and said, that's £60 for your meal and I serve you notice, what would you do? Pay or ask for a bill? Well, you'd pay then, obviously. You ask for a bill. Have you ever thought about actually asking the council, can I have a bill, please, for my council tax? because you've never actually sent me one. This is simply a tool of revenue collection. And the true reason this is being forced upon you is because your person is simply to maintain the illusion that they have control over your life, your fortune and your freedom. Because your fear and their ability to take from you something you deem to be valuable. And that is money. This is the real truth. You're the currency, not money. You are. Because without you, this country grinds to a halt. Because the principal workforce of any machine or any corporation or any company are slaves. And they have to give you something to believe in so you will do that work and you will not question. And to make it valuable, they're going to stiff you with as many fines that I'll make believe to make you give over that worthless piece of paper 
to another corporation just so you believe it's real. No? This is what I entered into. Some of you might know what I'd done. A friend of mine, Robin, who sat in the audience, gave me some information once. And funny enough, another gentleman who sat in the audience gave me the same information. And I looked at it, and it's called Lawful Rebellion. It's actually wrote in Magna Carta 1215. It's Article 61. Now, I know a lot about Magna Carta now, and I know that Magna Carta certainly wasn't right for us. And we've got no, we can't use it. We can't use it. But we can use the method of lawful rebellion, because lawful rebellion says, and what Article 61 actually says, it says, lawfully hinder, and it says, you never, must never ever use violence. We can't sort this out with violence. Because if we sort this out with violence, violence will always ensue. We have to do this peacefully. And the way we do it peacefully is learning the rules of the game. So when these people come to us, not only...